Do you ever uh, stop and ponder how your life and, and career may have panned out had you not become a, a member of the Jimi Hendrix Experience? Uh, <laughs> well, I've been sort of talking about this a lot recently. Um, my first sort of, what was the word, ambition was to actually just be a professional musician, you know, which I became anyway. And, um, and then sort of like suddenly when I was 20 years old, I joined up with Jimi Hendrix and about three months later we had like a, a top ten hit, Hey Joe, and suddenly within three months we were doing tours, television shows, etc, etc, and I was quite taken aback and then like, um, as I said earlier, I just wanted to be a professional musician and suddenly I'm sort of playing with this huge band and I'm only like 20, 21 years old. <laughs> <laughs> What was your, your musical involvement before the before the experience? Right. Well, I, going back on my things, I first started playing music when I was about nine. At primary school, I actually took up the violin because my best friend, David, had taken it up. And then I, the, the teacher f found out that I had some ability. And then I'd say a couple of years later, I tried a mandolin. And when I was about 12, I... Sort of got a guitar somewhere, an acoustic guitar, and um, started playing guitar. Got a chord book, and then in those days there was people like um, the Shadows, who you've heard of, and all that sort of people. And in those days in Britain, there was Eddie Cochran, uh, Gene Vincent Presley, of course, <clears throat> and then like later on Johnny Kidd and the Pirates, and that sort of stuff. And then within when I was about fifteen, I'd got my own little group together called the, uh, what we called the Lonely Ones, and, uh, and I went to art college after grammar school, and um, at art college, the um, headmaster said I should make a choice, either a musician or an art teacher or a commercial artist, so I became a professional musician. <laughs> I should have become a commercial artist, I earned more. <laughs> and that's when I was about, like, 16 and a half, 17, I went professional when I was about 17. I believe you were almost about to, to throw in guitar and uh, concentrate on drums if you, you didn't get the, the gig and the, the experience. Is that right? Well, not really. Like, um, I was sort of disillusioned because there's a lot of guitar players about, and we were doing well, but the thing is, I'd realised that there was no drummers in Kent. There's only one who worked with me, Pete Kircher. Um... So I suddenly thought I was going to go up to London on the train, take my guitar and amp in, swap it in, and get a drum kit. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I think it's one of the times I went up to London on the train that I'd read in the Melody Maker or one of those musical papers that Eric Burden was auditioning for the New Animals. And um, he'd actually sat in with one of my bands, the Loving Kind in London, as a club a few months previously and so I thought well, I can attempt to black my way into that audition which I did but I think they've got a guitar player by then at which point Mr. Jazz Chandler the late bass player from the Animals and our producer and manager God bless him um, came up to me and said can I play bass and I said uh, no but I'll give it a go <laughs> and I did. We played three tunes for this American gentleman, myself, keyboard player and a drummer. And this American gentleman said, um, would you like to go down the pub? Which is most musicians say, of course. And um, we went down to this little pub and had a pint of bitter, which he, he was just getting used to. And um, we were talking about music. He was asking me about the English music scene. I was asking about the American music scene. <clears throat> so I'd never been there at that point. And then he said, would I like to join his group? And that was it. That was um, Mr. James Hendrix. Were you aware of Jimmy before this? Had, no. Had you, hadn't heard of him at all? No, not at all. Oh, Irish, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of uh, operator was Chaz uh, as, a, as a manager, coming straight out of a band himself? Right. Well, I found this lot out later. I think... Um, Chaz could be here, so Chaz had to keep in with Michael Jeffries because Michael Jeffries was 
the animals manager as well. And I think legally, Chaz had to sort of keep a contact with him. And that's when, like Chaz said, he was going to go into, like, it was mainly production, it wasn't really management. But um, Chaz was the guy who found Hendrix, and uh, he was a great producer. And it was only, like, after, after the first two albums that um, the band fell apart, and that's when Chaz sort of left, because we, were, we used to go in the studio and put down <coughs> three tracks in, like, an hour or so. You know, second take and then like on the third album um jimmy was trying to sort of like start producing and then on the 58th take Charles would say the second one was about the best jimmy <laughs> you know what i mean and oh no man we have to do it again so Charles promptly left at which point the band collapsed you know when you uh, recorded hey joe as your first single how confident were, were you of its success well, I'd, prior to the experience, we're talking about late 66 when we started doing Hey Joe. Uh, prior to the experience, I'd only done, let me think, I'd done three singles with my band called The Loving Kind, uh, for Pick Pie, Piccadilly Records. And previous to that, in 64, I'd gone to some place, a demo studio, and put down a demo which we sold to local jukeboxes. but. My recording experience at that point, excuse the pun, was uh, very limited. So when we first started doing it, we, we, we went to different studios in London, I think, because Chaz had made deals, and we used to go and do a gig and then go in the studio for a couple of hours. And we did it in various different studios, Hey Joe, and we sort of got it together at last. And then they put it out, and then it got to, like, number seven or something. You know. <laughs> Talk about, um, about Monterey. Do you have vivid memories of that festival, and were you aware beforehand of, of Jimmy's grand finale plans there at the gig? No. Um, <laughs> no. Uh, I actually watched um, a bit of film last night. Someone's doing a little documentary, supposedly, about me or something. And I was playing some of the uh, Monterey stuff and as far as I knew it's like my first trip to America in June 67 um, I didn't realise sort of like <coughs> what I was in for um, we sort of arrived there and all my sort of like heroes were there Booker T, Otis Redding and all these sort of people and um, we did our show and uh, I didn't know that Jimmy was going to do that thing again because he'd done it once before in England at, on a, a theatre tour with uh, the Walker Brothers and Cat Stevens. That's the first time he did it when uh, I think our publicist at that point, Keith Altham, said, uh, oh, at the end of fire, Jim, why don't you set fire to the guitar? And he did. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't realise he was going to do it then, but then once he started putting it on the floor getting out the old lighter fluid I thought here we go again <laughs> and I sort of <clears throat> backed into my area on the stage Do you feel a lot of pressure doing that gig? Uh, it's pretty a huge debut gig to do in America and I guess it was also an, an important homecoming for, for Jimmy Yeah I'd say for, for Jimmy because like, he hadn't made it in America he'd only been playing in sort of backup bands etc uh, so I suppose it was a big thing for him to come back and playing in front of like 50,000 people with all these people and like the people who got us on the thing the committee was like, I think it was mainly Paul McCartney who got us on the gig and uh, but then for myself and Mitch it was amazing for us because we were so young and it was our first American trip and it's quite amazing I sort of but I really enjoyed it personally. Loved it actually. Now around this time there was the the bizarre mismatch, I guess, of uh, the experience on the road with the monkeys. Oh right. What can you remember of that situation? Um. <laughs> um. Can I talk about that? We were in. We'd done Monterey, and we were in Frisco, and we went and did this thing with um, Bill Graham, 
we were supporting the Jefferson Aeroplane for a week at the Fillmore West, and then the next night they were supporting us. Um, but um, we were working there, and I think we went, yeah, we worked there for about another week after Monterey. And then, um, I remember this vividly, we were all in Jimmy's room, I think, and Joplin was there, and there's Chaz, myself, and Mitch, and we all sit them out. And there was a phone call from Michael Jeffries for Chaz, and he said, sort of said, um, guess what I've done, you know? I've got the lads on a monkey's tour. So, like, um, <laughs> Chaz sort of freaks out, but I think that um, Michael Jeffries had actually signed us to it. And then, so what we did, we went to the East Coast and we sort of met the monkeys down in Florida somewhere and we did about six to seven dates with them. We didn't go down that well at all because um, it was a monkeys uh, um, situation with 15, 16 year old girls, etc. you know. And um, um, we were only doing like three songs a night and we weren't actually going down that well. You know what I mean? Mm, yep. And um, so I think we got up to New York. We'd sort of like um, done, um, uh, yeah, we started in Florida. We went up sort of like North Carolina. And we, we ended up in New York sort of like six, seven days later. And we played in this place called Forest Hill. It was like a, it was like a, um, it's a big tennis court or something. Anyway, we sort of played there, uh, and at which point I think Chaz and your man from America, Dick Clark, who's a big promoter, radio owner, etc., etc. I think they sort of uh, sort of sussed out this little story, which they leaked to the press, saying that um, the experiences um, act was obscene and the was it the mothers of the American Revolution or something like that, had um, sort of stated we should be banned from the tour because we're obscene or something like that, which was a good little bit of PR. But yeah. the thing is, it got into world press. And after sort of Monterey and then doing the monkeys thing and then being accused of being obscene on stage, which we weren't, it was amazing publicity. So, uh, you know, took it from there. We were supposed to, sorry, we were supposed to go to America that um, summer, I think for three weeks or so. And then suddenly it was like, uh, <laughs> we were in America for like um, three months. We sort of did the West Coast and we did the East Coast and we sort of did some stuff in Detroit and... Um, other various places and we went back to England by which time we'd had our third sort of like top ten hit and then we headlined our own uh, theatre tour in um, autumn 67 with The Move and The Amen Corner and various other people and Pink Floyd and um, then suddenly you know we were huge within about a year at any point did it become a, a source of annoyance to yourself and Mitch that Jimmy was getting all the attention and the kudos, considering that the experience was really a band as such? Yeah, well, not really. Like, there's a few times when we used to get to gigs and, like, they used to say Jimi Hendrix. So I used to go out with a pen and write the experience underneath, <laughs> <laughs> you know. And then, as you say, like, Jimmy obviously was the front man. He wrote all the songs, well, 98%. And, uh... Doesn't bother me because, like, when I play, I just sort of stand about and, you know, I don't leave about. So it was, he was the front man, so we didn't sort of really care. But the thing is, he couldn't have done it without myself and Mitchell. How did the, the relationships Sorry. within the group uh, cope with the, the heavy touring schedule? Well, any time. <laughs> uh, any, let me think. Any arguments between say for example Hendrix and I would be over young ladies <laughs> probably or sometimes later on he tended to um, as I put in my diary 
he tended to pull a moody on stage because like he was a big star you know but there again so were we and he'd sort of like turn his back to the audience and if, if the amp was hitting that sort of stuff but then after the gig i'd say to him i say look james we're supposed to be professionals like if the amp hisses you carry on hey man you know but that was our only arguments you know like we were worked so hard anyway how much of a say did uh, you and mitch get in the studio um well chairs were producing Jimmy was right. um regarding arrangements um mitch and myself came in on arrangements like certain ideas then Chaz would come up with ideas I'd come up with ideas for Jimmy because I was a guitar player like uh, see last week we were, someone sent me this tape that on the first album that track called Remember and uh, I was playing someone sent me this bootleg and it actually on tape it's us lot learning it in the did like I think an, up from the skies he sort of suggested brushes or something which were sort of unheard of in those days especially for like us lot which is like quote a rock band you know are there any of the the experience albums that uh well, you never get tired of hearing more so than the others my favorite album would be um access boulders love mm. um i sometimes sort of like play various tracks you know um I wouldn't play them that much, really. But if I'm out playing um, with like my new band, we do a couple of experience tracks. We do Stone Free and Manic Depression. And what else do we do? We might do Hey Joe, but that's about it, you know. Yeah. In a live situation, what point do you, do you think the, the band really hit its peak and got to sound exactly like the band you always wanted it to be? Right. I'd say the experience's peak was in late 67, very early 68, but then due to the amount of work we were doing, <coughs> it all sort of fell apart, especially when chairs left as well. Did you see that uh, coming? Um, it all sort of fell apart, and especially when like chairs left. Yeah. Was that done something you could see coming for a while, or was it a sudden thing? No, I could see it happening. Yeah. I could see it happening, yeah. I could see it happening. What did you personally think of Jimmy's uh, post-experience work? Well, I didn't know nothing about it. Um, uh, oh, oh, okay, got you. I was thinking differently. Um, what, the Band of Gypsies thing? Yeah, yeah. I was just watching that yesterday as well so I've been <laughs> going through for this documentary and I sort of played that and because uh, he did those two nights in the Fillmore right yep December what was that 69 and they say it was like he had to do two gigs there but that was a contractual situation there was this guy called uh, uh, what's his name um I'll think of it in a minute. Like, Hendrix had signed with this guy in sort of like 64 or something for one dollar. And this guy had actually held him to it and um, sued the experience. And um, this documentary, I can't remember his name. Mental Block. And uh, basically the two performances they did at the Fillmore East was uh, for contract thing mm -hmm. because this guy out of their settlement whatever happened which I never knew about um, they had to produce an album for Capital who this guy um, was dealing with at that point and uh, I found out later he got like two points off Axis Boulder's Love and he was given two million bucks you know, which I never saw anyway. Oh. Ed, his name is Ed Chalpin. Mm -hmm. And uh, I won't say anything further. <laughs> <laughs> Has it bothered you at all the, the large quantities of uh, previously unreleased material that, that's been put out over the years? Um, but they can't 
sort of bring out that much more because uh, that's like, a bit of dry, um, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like um, as I just said, even last week I sent some outtakes um, with all this early stuff, and it's just like us lot rehearsing in the studio, and then people send me these sort of like things from the audience, but you can't hear the bands and the sound is. But I'd say as we, we only recorded three albums, and then. I don't know how many albums there are out now, and like compilations, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Mm. It's like quite amazing. It still, sort of freaks me out. Um, I think there can't be much more they can bring out. No. But there again, I've heard um, people sent me things or played me stuff, and I said I've never heard that track before, and that's not Hendrix playing on it. <laughs> so like, people have done that as well. Yeah. You know, and, like these little tapes you buy Jimi Hendrix like, he's not even on it anyway that's another story uh, if Jimmy had lived and indeed still been making music today where, where do you think he'd be musically I'd say he'd be producing yeah personally mm -hmm. I'd say he'd have got into producing and writing and then maybe working with probably younger musicians you know because like I'd like to get into that bit of producing because like Everyone said it's hard, but it's quite cushy. All we have to do is come up with ideas. And uh, that's what I think he'd be doing. Like A lot of people said that he was going to get into jazz and all that sort of stuff, which I don't know, I sort of disagree with because I've heard various stories, I don't know if they're right, that um, he was supposed to have been doing some sessions with, um, what's his name, Miles Davis. Oh, yes. Now, I heard this story that um, uh, said supposedly that, like, Davis's manager phoned up Jeffries and said, uh, Miles will go in the studio if you give him $5,000 in cash up front. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know, that could just be a story, you know, because they were saying that he was going to work with him. But, you know, like... I met people on the road who saw the band play in 1972. <laughs> <coughs> Let's talk about what you've been up to uh, since those days. Have you had problems over the years gaining acceptance for, for your own work, with, with people being too intent on focusing on, on what you've done in the past? Not now. No, not, not now. now. Thankfully, <laughs> not now. Uh, so I sort of went back to my, well, after the experience, I had the Fat Mattress, which is still like a cult situation. And I did, I moved to Ireland and I had, like, the Clonakilty Cowboys, which they called the Noel Wedding Band, which is a load of, I hated the title, <laughs> with Eric Bell from Thin Lizzy and Les Sampson, my drummer, who I still work with, and a guy called David Clark, not Dave Clark, the drummer, who co-wrote and played piano. And we worked, did, like, American tours, uh, European tours, and I found out, had two albums out on RCA, 74, 75, and I found out that the management were being quite clever with the money. So we took them to court in London and I was supposed to get a settlement and then so I carried on working until like 1980, still living in Ireland. I started an acoustic situation with my girlfriend, Carol Appleby, who wrote my book, who unfortunately got killed in 1990. We started a, an acoustic situation with harmonies and that and we worked for like 10 years we worked in america italy ireland and then coming back from a gig she got killed and then uh, since then i've done uh, a lot of telework a lot of session work and a load of tours so thank god i'm busy mate yeah you are busy just said earlier you got a new band happening and tell us a little bit about Sorry. that right um that last spring I had this Italian tour offered to me and then my normal drummer couldn't do it so I called up Eric Bell the Lizzie guy who I've been playing with since 74 quite a long time now and we get on rather well he's a wonderful guitar player and then we were saying and then I got this agent he said do you know the guy from Status Quo John Cochran I said yeah I met him 28 years ago well, he's available for the tour. So I said, yeah. So I phoned him up. 
and we met at London Airport, we rehearsed on the plane, and we did an Italian tour. And that was it. <laughs> <laughs> and we done about a year. We'd done like, a lot of UK gigs. We'd done um, France. We'd done Austria. A couple of three things in Italy. And next week we were off to the north of Ireland and then into England. And then we got, I have to go to Canada to record an album. And then I come back and we have to go to Denmark and then we might have an American tour. So I'm still at it. And in the meantime, I'm attempting to put a new album together as the first one in 22 years. <laughs> Fantastic. And what uh, direction are we going there on the album? Um, I've got a load of old stuff, old demos. <clears throat> which I've cleaned up. So it can be like old stuff, which I wrote in like 1970, and then hopefully it'd be a double CD, and then like uh, other stuff like, for example, a very obscure Eddie Cochran song, which I was playing last night, called Dark Lonely Street. Have you ever heard that? Uh, it rings a bell, yeah. Right, well, no one knows it, but, well, people would know about it. And then like... Um, couple of Lennon songs which I thought about Rain that thing called Rain I've put that down already mm. and the other one called Cry Baby Cry and then I got this Bob Dylan song from 63 called She Belongs to Me mm -hmm. and then basically then um, the rest would be like originals a bit of everything yeah really. it would be from it would be like myself from like 1964 until 1999 so and I've got all pictures and all that sort of stuff which I kept and then that's the idea and I'm sort of working on that in between touring Fantastic What type of venues are you playing now? Is it mainly uh, clubs or theatres? Uh, we're playing theatres now our last stuff last year was like big pubs and stuff like that which, which went down well but this this tour we're doing now is like theatres which is much nicer because like you only work for like an hour and you can go to bed early. <laughs> <laughs> We're all old musicians now. Yeah. We call ourselves the Elderly Brothers. Oh, the Elderly Brothers. <laughs> the Elderly <laughs> Brothers. You great listen to, to music these days? Do you listen to much? Sorry? Do you listen to much current music or? No, I don't. No? Um, if I was playing any music these days, I'd actually still play the Small Faces or the Kinks or the Move. But there again, I do like Oasis. And that band, what are they called? Pulp or something. They did some tune about Down in the Country. Mm hmm. Yep. Which was quite an attractive tune. You know, I was thinking about learning it. But like um, the other stuff, I don't like, I don't listen to at all. Like the radio and the telly, I only listen to the news, and that's about it. And uh, just before we wind up, if you could go back to 1967 and do the, the whole thing all over again, what would be the one thing that you'd make sure was handled differently? Right, 67. Mm-hmm. Anything handled differently. Right. I'd say the big boob was uh, the monkeys too. But there again, you reverse that, and like the PR we got from it was so big that it made up for it. Turned the, um, yeah, turn the negative into a positive. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. But, uh, you know. And then, like, 68, like, our first American tour in 68 of that year, we did, like, 56 gigs in 53 days or something. It was, like, unbelievable. Anyway, we're still here, thank God. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, now I look. I, I hope to be coming to Australia at some point. Oh, look, we'd love to see you down here. I, I've never been there. I'd like to go. Uh, you'd be more than a welcome visitor for sure. Right. It's okay. a long spin on a plane, but I'd like to. I've been to Kiwi, but not Aussie. Oh, look. I'd like to zip down and just hang out, and I hear you've got some good beer there. We certainly have. Bring, bring the elderly brothers down. We'd, we'd love to see you. The elderly brothers. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, now look, thanks for your time. Much appreciated. You're very uh, welcome, mate. Thanks for all that wonderful music over the years. Best of luck with uh, your touring and uh, the new album. We'll keep our eyes out for that. And then I hope to see you in Aussie. We'll be here waiting for you. 
Thank you, sir. Thanks, Noel. Good luck, man. All the best. Bye-bye.